introduce yourself first? Hmm? Do you want to introduce yourself first? Okay. Uh, so I'm Kristen Madden. I'm the archivist at the History Museum. Uh, so basically what I do is I handle all of the research questions for people, and I also handle all of the paper, audiovisual material at the museum. And I'm Christy Dunn. Um, I'm the registrar at the History Museum, which is actually Jennifer's old job. And I'm responsible for incoming artifact donations and artifact loans. And uh, we both do a lot of the cataloging and everything. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, the relationship between Ruth Mir and the History Museum goes back even further because I had my very first museum internship at Ruth Mir. So we've just sort of been swapping people over the last 15 years or so. One last announcement I forgot. Um, we are recording this and we're gonna be posting it so others who couldn't be here could, could enjoy this as well. If you happen to have a device on you and you can put that on silent or better yet, just off entirely, we'd appreciate that, thank you. I even double checked mine and I keep mine on silent all the time, yep. anyhow. So, uh, the History Museum in South Bend is actually the national repository for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. Usually they think of the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, which is a very, it, it's a wonderful museum, but they just have a section for the All-American Girls. And um, we were sort of blessed by the Players Association to have an entire gallery in our lower level and players a lot of times they will donate their old items to us or family members will donate their stuff and it's kind of been something Kristen and I have fallen into learning about we neither of us were sports historians before about 10 years ago and now we can't get enough of the league mm -hmm. um, so without further ado we'll start at the very beginning how many of you know what was happening in 1942 what big event were we involved in <laughs> you all know yeah world war ii and how many of you are cubs fans okay great the rest of you jennifer will show you out the door <laughs> no. i um my grandpa was a huge cubs fan and my mom and i always told everyone that they're not losing they're just you know making people underestimate them so that they can come for the win. <laughs> so Philip K. Wrigley, um, the son of Wrigley from Wrigley Field, he actually is responsible for starting the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. In 1942, um, they were watching as many of the minor league teams, uh, a good majority of them, had already gone defunct. They had already shut down, there were no games. And that was starting to happen in the major leagues as well. Now baseball, as you know, is considered America's national pastime. And they were afraid of um, the major leagues going defunct as well because every man 18 and older, and actually in a lot of cases, boys under 18 were being drafted or volunteering to go into the military. So Wrigley got together with uh, the assistant to the Chicago Cubs general manager, Ken Sells, to come up with an idea. And Ken actually already had a women's softball team that he was training, that was competing. Women's softball was, you know, a fun thing to get ladies out of the house at the time. And he had an idea, what if we train the women's softball to compete in the major leagues. And of course, this took some convincing, but Wrigley and Ken decided that it would be worth the try. It kind of would be enough to intrigue people of women playing pro sports to go and you know see them. So the committee recommended the Girls Softball League to be established and prepared to go into the major league parks should attendance fall due to the franchise's gathering too, many, too few crowds. So even at the very beginning, it was a backup to Major League. Um, it was, you know, oh, we can't bring the crowds in because we don't have enough teams for the Major League, so we'll have this sort of fun entertainment game. So the Major League cities didn't want the softball teams, which, 
you know, that was very disappointing because that was the whole shtick behind this was a substitution. So they found four cities that were willing to give this a shot. Rockford, Illinois, a lot of you are familiar with the Rockford Peaches from a league of their own. South Bend, Indiana with the South Bend Blue Sox and then Kenosha and Racine, Wisconsin. You'll notice that all of the cities are within, you know, a few hours driving from one to the next. This is because during World War II, there were uh, food and fuel rations put on. So traveling any distance was gonna be expensive. So it started in the Great Lakes region and it expanded not too much further, but we'll get to that in a little <coughs> bit. Excuse me. Bless you. So Wrigley's advertising director, Arthur Meyer. Meyerhoff, Meyerhoff, right there. This is Wrigley, by the way. I'm doing a good job standing in front of the slideshow <laughs> here. Um, he actually was responsible for working with the cities and getting the cities to agree to, you know, this happening. And, um, you know, he arranged for the tryouts for the women to have housing. And in 1944, Wrigley actually turned over ownership of um, All American Girls Professional Baseball Leagues to Meyerhoff. So if you've heard that name, he wasn't responsible for the initial creation, but he was responsible for making it happen and then became the owner. Now, for the very first season, 200 women tried out and only 60 were chosen. And here I wanted to show these pictures because um, the women, you know, a lot of baseball training, you have running, you have the hitting. Um, wow, I just described baseball in a very simplistic way, didn't I? There's weight training involved. There's weight training involved too. <laughs> um, and a lot of the women, they still had to do the traditional female calisthenics. So they would be on the field doing that. And this right here was because um, Wrigley, he wanted to portray that patriotism. You know, it's wartime. These women are leaving the homes and in some cases taking sabbaticals from the jobs that they had, even in factories where they were substituting for the men in the factories. And they would take a little bit of time and go and do this. So he wanted to explain and show why this was important. And one of the ways he did that was at the beginning of every game, the players would go and form a V for victory on the field. And so you'll see a lot of pictures where the women are standing like that at the very beginning. Um, Wrigley's idea was to um, make men dream of the girls they left behind, basically. So he was playing on the all-American girl image. And um, what he wanted was to basically show the all-American girl, the girl next door in spikes. So very feminine girl, very tough woman. Um, the players played an even greater part in displaying patriotism by playing exhibition games. So, and this is especially at the beginning before they're playing, you know, really hard against each other because you still only had four teams at the beginning. So they were playing Red Cross games, um, games for the armed forces. They would actually go and play for wounded veterans at army hospitals. And the talent was apparently considered very abundant. It was such a high caliber that they had a hard time whittling down to the players that they wanted, basically. And that led to more teams being created. So at the very beginning, you have the four teams, Rockford and South Bend, Rockford Peaches and South Bend Blue Sox, are the only two teams that played the entire stretch of the AAGPBL's existence. Kenosha and Racine, they stopped um, Kenosha in 1952, Racine in 1951. In 1944, you had two other teams join, Milwaukee and Minneapolis, and then they changed ownership to the Grand Rapids Chicks and the Fort Wayne Daisies. 
1946, you add two more teams, Muskegon and Peoria. 48 was the year with the highest player attendance. And you can see that reflected in how many teams there are. Chicago and Springfield only played for one season. Springfield actually only played for part of a season. Um, and that they essentially kind of saturated the demand for the players. And upon doing that, you know, you have fewer people able to or willing to spend the money to go to the games. And then you have a couple of more um, ownership trades. Here you have Muskegon turning into the Kalamazoo Lassies and Racine goes to Battle Creek and then goes to Muskegon. So all in all, there were 15 teams that played. A lot of times you'll see the number 14 because Springfield, like I said, was only for part of a season. So here we have when the league was created, peak attendance in 1948 and the league's final season in 1954. The All-American host cities organized junior leagues for girls 14 and older um, because 14 to 18 was, you know, you had a lot of good players, a lot of women who would go into the workforce, but technically not adults, just like you had with the young men. The teams traveled to exotic locations for spring training, Mississippi in 1946, <laughs> Opalaka, Florida in 1949, and the big one that if you've heard about any of the spring trainings, you've probably heard of this, was Havana, Cuba in 1947. The rules were modified each year because they started off with traditional softball rules, um, smaller infields, larger balls, underhand pitching. And each year that changed a little bit because they discovered one, the women played tougher than they anticipated. Two, people liked the more exciting games. And of course, if it's harder, then you have more action. If the game is easier for the people playing, you sit there and you watch the points go up, everyone scores points, you know it's gonna happen and it's not quite as exciting because everyone has the ability. And um, postseason tours went to Cuba and South America and they actually had a plan to create an international league. That did not happen though. Um, the Sallies and the Chicago Colleens were added to the roster in 48, but didn't stay. And, um, pardon me, as I lose my spot in my notes. While you're thinking of that, the year that the ladies also went to Cuba, Jackie Robinson was with yes. the Dodgers training down there. And they actually had newspapers making st statements that more people went to go see the girls play baseball than the Dodgers. So uh, Cuba loved women's baseball. Yeah. And um, you end up seeing the American girls started off as um, all white. The uh, African leagues were still separate for men's baseball and women's. You had separate African American leagues. But all American girls did have an ever growing number of um, Cuban and Puerto Rican players. So, yes. Yeah, I'll have switch you spots. <laughs> okay. You so, I'm going to talk to you about my favorite team. I'm a little biased the South Bend Blue Sox. So here we have the 1943 inaugural team at Bendix Field. Like Christy said, they were one of the first four teams to be added to the league. Um, also one of two teams that made it through all 12 years. Um, and they also got to say that they were the beginning of a lot of really well-known players, including Dottie Schroeder, um, who played all 12 seasons as well. Um, a lot of people say that she she and Dottie Kamenchek are actually the basis for Dottie Collins, Gina Davis's character from A League of Their Own. Uh, so the team actually started at Bendix Field, um, which was located next to Bendix Factory. It's about where Bendix Airfield is now. And then in 1946, they moved to Playland Park, um, which was a very large amusement park area. Um, 
It's about where IUSB is now. They actually have a little part of the grandstands that are left over by uh, student housing that you can still see. It's all blocked off now, but um, it's still very interesting to go and kind of see what's left of it. Uh, so let's see here. Now I've lost my spot. <laughs> we start talking and think of things we want to say and ramble off into a different direction yes. than we have planned. Uh, so in 1943, the Blue Sox finished 0.001% behind the Kenosha Comets, who came in second that year. Um, pitchers Margaret Berger and Doris Barr threw 79 of the 91 games played that uh, season, and they were credited with um, 40 of the wins that year. And uh, Doris said that it was the greatest accomplishment she ever made that season. Uh, Jim Costin, who was a reporter for the Tribune, actually wrote that if you've never seen a girl playing baseball before, uh, they were surprising with their artistry displayed. Um, let's see here. No, nope, we're going to talk about that. That is Margaret Berger and Doris Barr. Let's see. Oh, well, I don't know what that's from. That is something different. Okay. Uh, let's see. The Blue Sox were actually so well loved in the city and the surrounding area that they brought in more people to come see them than a lot of the men's teams. And at that time, a lot of the factories had their own personal baseball team. So more people were going to see the girls' leagues than they were to see the guys. Uh, and in 1944, the Blue Sox drew in almost 50,000 people to come see them that season. Uh, that actually would be the capacity of Four Winds Field in South Bend 10 times over. So you just imagine 10 of those stacked together. That's how many people just loved coming to see the Blue Sox play. Uh, in 51 and 52, the Blue Sox won back-to-back -back championships, but unfortunately their last two years they didn't do so great. Uh, <laughs> And the league recruited women of the highest caliber of athleticism from all over the country. And then later on in uh, the Southern uh, countries, Puerto Rico and Cuba, they also got the best chaperones for the girls and also the best uh, coaches. So Bert Nyhoff was a second baseman who played for the Cincinnati Reds, the Philadelphia Phillies, the St. Louis Cardinals, and the New York Giants between 1913 and 1918. He went on to coach and scout and manage for teams like the New York Giants and the New York Yankees. And he managed the Blue Sox from 43 and 44. Uh, Marty McManus spent 15 years in the major leagues as a second and third baseman for the St. Louis Browns, the Detroit Tigers, my hometown, uh, the Boston Red Sox, and the Boston Braves. After that, he managed the Boston Red Sox, and he ran the Blue Sox in 1945, and then again in 1948, and in 51, he actually began a really long spree in trying to unionize professional baseball. And now we're gonna talk about the chaperones. Uh, so the chaperones were there, if you guys remember the movie, they weren't nearly as stuffy and uptight as they make it out to be in the film, but they were really, cause a lot of the girls were 16, 17, 18, early 20s, haven't really left home. They were there to kind of make sure that nobody took advantage of them. Um, so they were there to kind of enforce the morals and policies of the league. Um, girls were forbidden to drink and to gamble. They had a curfew. Um, you actually weren't allowed to wear shorts or pants in public. They always had to wear skirts. Um, and they were allowed to go out on dates, but they had to get permission from the chaperone and the manager. And sometimes the chaperones even interviewed uh, prospective dates. Um, quite a few girls were underage, like I said, and they had a lot of stories of uh, going out on a date with a young man and they say, well, I have my hotel is right over here and suddenly a chaperone just sort of emerges and they're like, mm, I don't think so. I think this date is over. <laughs> So uh, Rose Virginia Way was the team chaperone in 1943, and Helen Moore was their chaperone the following year. Uh, 
Uh, so like Christy said, uh, 200 women came to Chicago to try to compete and only 60 of them ended up actually making into the league the first year. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some of our well-known players. <laughs> Betsy Jockham. So Betsy uh, was one of the first players to be in the South Bend Blue Sox. She played from 1943 to 1948. Her rookie year, she led the league in at-bats, hits, singles, and doubles. Uh, she was chosen for the first all-star team, which was held at Wrigley Field, which was also the first year that they ever had electric lights uh, for night games. So that was a big year for everyone. Um, she actually went to Havana with everyone, and I have met Betsy, and she said it was the first time she'd ever been on an airplane, which was amazing and terrifying for her. Uh, and let's see, she actually excelled in the overhand pitch. She was a first baseman and an outfielder for a really long time, and a lot of the girls had a hard time moving from first side pitching to overhand, and she did really well in the overhand pitching, so she switched to pitching her final year. Um, and she ended up quitting because she found out from a player that she was going to be moved to a different town, and she didn't want to, so she decided, I really like South Bend, I think I'm just gonna stay here. Then we have Mary Bonnie Baker, who was uh, scouted by Hub Bishop, who went on to scout people like Gordy Howe of the Detroit Wed Wings. She was a former model, and they used her for a lot of the publicity. Um, she was actually known as Pretty Bonnie Baker in the newspapers. Um, she appeared in the cover of Life magazine. Um, and she began her career with the South Bend Blue Sox in the league's first year and stayed with the team until 1950. Um, in 1946, she had an all-star season, stealing 94 bases, and she batted a .286 and had a .965 fielding percentage. And then we have Dottie Schroeder. Um, she entered the league in 1943 for South Bend, playing for them for two and a half years before she moved to Kenosha, Fort Wayne, Kalamazoo. Um, in her first season, she was the league shortstop with a feeling, uh, in fielding average, collected 32 stolen bases. Um, in addition to playing 16 professional seasons, she also holds the all-time records for most games played, at-bats, RBIs, and walks in the history of the league. And then Jean Fau. Um, she is in the league considered one of the greatest overhand pitchers. Um, from 1946 through 1953, she set several all-time and single season records and compiled a lifetime record of um, 140 wins and 64 losses and a 1.23 earned run average. Uh, in 235 pitching appearances, and she has the lowest uh, ERA for any pitcher in the league. Uh, she pitched two perfect games, uh, had two no-hitters, twice winning the Triple Crown, and collecting three 20-win seasons. Um, she also led in wins, strikeouts three times, and led the league record for single-season winning percentages, um, and then led the league to a championship in 51 and 52. All right. And now I get to talk to you about a league of their own. Um, so a lot of you have probably seen the movie. We've both seen the movie. Um, I like telling people a little bit about the history, but a lot of people know about the history of the league through the movie. And there are Although it is very accurate in a lot of aspects, it's also inaccurate in a number of ways that over the years, my poor heart, knowing all of them, have just made me very sad. Uh, so, Ali of Their Own actually started out as a documentary. Um, it was done by a gentleman named Cal uh, Kelly Candell. Uh, his mom was Helen Callahan and his aunt was Margaret Callahan and both of them ended up playing in the league. Um, so his mom um, and his aunt were recruited when they were playing um, 
in the US for a tournament. Both of them were from Vancouver. Um, they were playing for Minneapolis for a little while, and then Margaret moved to Fort Wayne in South Bend, um, and Helen played for Fort Wayne in Kenosha. So he had heard all these stories, and there wasn't a lot of information about this. A lot of the ladies just didn't talk about their time in the league, and he thought that that was a shame. So, oh my goodness, this stopped. That wasn't supposed to happen. How did this stop? No, go back. Christy, what do I do? I don't know. It timed out. I'm sorry. It must have a timer on it still. I think it might. Okay. Uh, so he came up, well, Christy is very generously doing this for me. Uh, so he came up in 1987 with a half an hour doctor documentary called A League of Their Own talking about Helen and Margaret and that. And initially it only broadcast in public television on uh, Los Angeles, and then it eventually made it uh, nationally. And it was during that time that Penny Marshall saw the documentary and thought that this was just an amazing story and was wondering why she also hadn't heard of it. And so she spent like five years coming up with a script, trying to sell this idea to executives, and finally got a script out that people agreed on um, and actually had Kendall uh, do a treatment for the script. And then we'll do yeah. Okay. You can see this nice little video from it. There we go. All right. So we'll pause that for a second. You want to stop on this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, as you see in there, Kit's very excited about the concept of how much money she might be making in the league. Um, most of the time, the girls, they got about $75 um, a week, which would have been pretty astonishing for that time, especially for a young lady. Most of the time, the average woman was making about half of that. Um, the women of the league could earn anywhere between $55 to $150 per week in reality. Um, often players made enough money to send part of their wages homes to their family. Um, a lot of the women actually talked about how they could do substitute teaching or even teaching for like a whole year and playing a summer of baseball was more than what they made doing their regular jobs. Um, a lot of the women actually used their wages from playing to go to college, which would be something that a lot of them didn't think that they would be able to accomplish. Um, so then we'll go to charm school. So charm school was a real thing that the women had to participate in in 1944. Um, they went to Peru, Illinois, and Ruth Tiffany School was contracted to do nightly classes for everybody. Um, they were supposed to uh, make bright stars of each player by integrating a healthy mind and healthy body. The art of walking, sitting, because everybody doesn't know how to do those two things. Uh, speaking, selecting clothes, applying makeup, and social skills were part of the program. And an Wrigley expected each woman to protect the all-American girl next door look while they had amazing athletic prowess out on the field. And just to kind of show you the things that they did, we have this guide for the all-American girl. How to look better, feel better, and be more popular. <laughs> uh, and it just, it lists some of the things that were supposed to be considered to be in your makeup regime. Rouge, cream deodorant, mital astringent, face powder, but only for brunettes, hand lotion and hair remover. It talked about the nightly routine that you were supposed to do. Um, and let's see, it gave you a 10 step process for what you were supposed to do after each game for taking care of yourself. Uh, so that was just a couple of the things that they had to do normally. Um, like I said, they weren't allowed to wear pants in public. Um, in the film, if you guys remember Marla Hooch, um, she was originally not going to be uh, recruited because she wasn't considered pretty enough. Um, that certain players had to fit within certain beauty re in, uh, regimes and standards. And in reality, some women were actually cut from the league because they didn't 
fit in after a while. Um, Josephine Jojo D'Angeli was actually cut from the blue socks because she cut her hair too short. Uh, she had what was considered a boy's haircut um, and was removed, unfortunately. Um, but thankfully, after 1944, you didn't have to go to charm school anymore. Uh, so we'll go to the next one. All right, so the scene where the African-American woman throws the ball over Dottie's head um, was a small nod to the fact that although uh, many women from Canada and Cuba were in the league, African-Americans weren't allowed to play um, in the major leagues yet. Um, in 1947, Jackie Robinson was allowed to go and uh, participate in being a part of the Dodgers. Um, and the league did, over a couple of years, think about adding African-American women into the league, but overall the consensus was that it just wasn't time to do that. Um, later on, when more of the teams became individually owned, they did say that if you decided that you wanted to have an African-American on your team, that would be okay, but they had to hit a certain standard of athleticism and nobody was allowed to say that they couldn't play if they went to a different, if they were playing against a different team. But everyone just kind of opted to not do it, unfortunately. Um, a couple of African-American women did end up trying. Um, most notably, it was Mammy Johnson. Um, she was the first African-American woman to join the Negro Leagues, and she actually tried to go to Wrigley Field in 1943 to do that. Um, but unfortunately, she was turned down. So we'll go to still one next. Uh, so everybody remembers our favorite little kid, Stillwell Angel. <laughs> um, so there weren't actual little kids <laughs> running around most of the time on the teams. Um, managers did have to worry about the possibility of players becoming pregnant. A lot of the older ladies were married. Um, their husbands overseas and things like that. Um, Dottie Collins, who you can see right there, uh, who was a pitcher for the Fort Wayne Daisies, ended up pitching in the summer of 1948 until she was four months pregnant. Um, a lot of people, except for um, her catcher and her manager, nobody else knew except for them. So everyone just kind of assumed that she was fine. And she had said that her husband and her doctor said, as long as you feel like playing, keep playing. Um, so she did for a while. Um, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. And so on August 1st, 1948, after a doubleheader with Peoria, uh, she decided that she was going to take a leave of absence from the league. Her first daughter, Patricia, was born in December that year. And she did go to a number of her mom's games, but she went with her dad and her grandma, so. <laughs> Not very good. Okay. And I'm gonna change the slide. I know it's been entertaining just watching this kid get hit with the ball <laughs> over and over again. Mm -hmm. All right, switch sides. Switch. Now, you may have heard us refer to the league by several different names. And I'm going to explain why. And I wrote it out so I got it in the exact sequence. <laughs> so bear with me. Here we go. So with the dedication of the group of Midwestern businessmen and financial support from Mr. Wrigley, the All-American Girls Softball League emerged in 1943. Midway through that first season, the Board of Trustees changed the league's name to the All-American Girls baseball league to make it distinctive from the existing softball teams and also because their rules of play were that of the major league baseball teams. However, the retention of shorter infield distances and the underhand pitching caused some controversy in the media about baseball being in the name. Thus, at the end of 1943, the official league name was again changed to the more descriptive All-American Girls Professional Ball League. The title was retained until the end of the 1945 season when All-American Girls Baseball League was again adopted and used, thankfully, for the next five years. So, you know, no rebranding for a few years. It was during this time that 
the bats changed, outfits started changing, size of the field changed, and the size of the ball changed, which we have examples of a couple of things for you. Oh, we'll wait till, towards okay. the end. Um, when the independent team owners started purchasing leagues, league teams, at the end of the 1950 season, the official league name was changed to American Girls Baseball League. But popula popularly, it continued to be identified as All-American League or the All-American Girls Baseball League. Not confusing at all, right? <laughs> through the organization of the Players Association in 1986 and through their efforts to gain recognition by the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1988, the league has now come to be recognized as what it is in actuality the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, the AAGPBL. <laughs> so, a lot of name changes, and if any of you have really looked at the patches on a uniform, you'll notice that some of them have AAGS, um, some of them just have AABL, AAGPBL, they have all of those, and this is why, it's because the name while it all, they all sounded similar, they kept changing officially. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit um, briefly about the Players Association. And this is what they have on their website. The Players Association is who we work with a lot. Um, as the museum, they're the ones that uh, decided that we were going to be the national repository. So oftentimes, if they need to borrow an artifact, or if they want to donate an artifact, if they want research, um, or we want research, it's a very mutually beneficial relationship. And if the league is submitting it to history, we're their first call. The AAGPBL Players Association, Inc. is an active nonprofit organization established for the following purposes. One, to research, collect, document, preserve, and promote the history of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Two, to provide opportunities for social interaction of the membership. Three, to disseminate historical, educational, and factual information regarding, regarding the league and its personnel. Four, to promote and support modern women's baseball. Players and other members provide interaction with schools, communities, sporting events, and historical organizations to promote sports participation. Players actively engage in sharing their experience by speaking to various groups and assisting in clinics and seminars pr to promote women in sports. We do not stop playing because we grow old, but we grow old because we stop playing. <laughs> And sure enough, Betsy Jockham, who um, Kristen had mentioned, um, when the History Museum started having our event, we have a yearly event at what was the Cove, now is Four Winds Field, to honor the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. And 2011, I think, was the first year we did that. And up until, I wanna say three or four years ago, Betsy threw the first pitch. And she just celebrated her 100th birthday this year. Yes. <laughs> so, go Betsy, you wanna talk a little bit about her birthday party real quick? Yeah, uh, so like Christy said, she turned 100 on February 8th. I remember that. Uh, and Betsy has done a number of things. She comes to all of our nights at Four Winds Field, signs autographs, takes photos with people. Everyone is always so excited to see her. Um, but she does a lot of talks at the museum. She's done a lot of interviews over the years for us. She's really been our rock when it comes to the baseball league. And so we decided on her 100th birthday, we had to do something. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, it made it a little more difficult to do things. Um, and two years ago, uh, Betsy was at a reunion and unfortunately fell down and broke her hip. And that was the time that she decided I probably should slow down a little bit <laughs> um, and ended up moving into a retirement facility. Um, so we decided that we were going to do what was very popular during the height of the pandemic is drive-by birthday parties. 
And so we actually got, oh, I want to say like we about 20 25. Or, yeah, 20 or 30 cars all decorated and we all came out and she actually was standing by the window watching everyone go by. We actually got Stu from the South Bend Cubs to stand outside and wave at her and wave at everybody. And we did that. It was pretty great. Um, she really enjoyed it. Um, and so, do you want to talk about the month Oh, we'll do that. Okay. Um, but the reason we wanted to talk about her and the Players Association is to show you all how important the league remains. We all know by this point why it was important in the 40s and up through the early 50s. And like Kristen said, the popularity sort of faded out. But nowadays it's become encouraging once again for young women. And I bet all of the women in here probably were encouraged by either, you know, hearing about the players or, um, you know, watching the movie or something as you were growing up. I know I was. Yes. Um, they really and, were kind of the beginning for getting Title IX to happen yeah. too. Um, so equality in the sports was really because of them, I like to say at least. <laughs> and so the Players Association, uh, it was actually created by a lot of children of the players themselves. As a matter of fact, the president right now, Rick Chapman, his um, mother was Dorothy Dottie Chapman. And I'm gonna show you an item of hers in a little bit. Um, and just last year, despite the pandemic, they created the American Girls Baseball. And this is to get girls from across the country, um, especially those who might be less privileged, to be able to be involved in sport and actually learn the sport and be able to compete with one another. So it's like a mini All-American Girls Professional Baseball. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we do a lot of are research requests. Um, both of us receive requests. National History Day is something the schools do across the country. And hands down, most of the research requests we get for that are about the league. Um, they ask about other things, but they come to us for that mostly. Um, Kristen has a lot of requests from book writers, TV shows, um, we both have from clothing historians, sports historians, gender studies classes, the list goes on. Um, and then not only do we do researches, research requests, but we also loan out items a lot. And that has grown quite a bit over the years. This first one, I think this might have been you, Jennifer, mm -hmm. um, the American Library in Paris want requested to borrow several items. We have sent over the years um, loans out to the California State Museum. Indianapolis Children's Museum currently has a loan of ours of a uniform used in a league of their own and some Blue Sox memorabilia. The AAGPBL Players Association themselves, News Reports, Good Morning America, NBC News Nightly, and Rockford, Kenosha, Fort Wayne, Chicago, Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, anywhere there was a team. <laughs> the libraries, the museums, the schools will contact us. Yes. We had a recent loan that I think you should mention. Uh, it was just last week. Yes, we were actually contacted by NBC for the Today Show, uh, where they were doing a spotlight on the history of women's baseball in conjunction with a sports center that's going up in Rockford and they asked for some photos of the Women's League. Uh, so that was very exciting. Last Thursday it was on television and I had to go and watch it afterwards. I was like, I put that in there. <laughs> so this, you know, I, I'd say it's probably to toot our horn a little bit. You know, we're, we are very proud of this collection and what we do and being able to talk about the women but it is mostly to show just how impactful they are and how much they're still doing. A lot of these things, if there are events associated, the players still go to them. 
Mm -hmm. um, Betsy is still involved and goes to our events even if she's not throwing the first pitch anymore. Mm -hmm. They, um, w when we lined up for Betsy's birthday party, um, the cars were lining up in this church parking lot. I don't know how many of you remember February 8th specifically, but I do because the wind chill was under zero. <laughs> And we were arranging cars and everything, and two other players bundled up and walked the entire parking lot with us, handing out bags of peanuts <laughs> so that it was like a baseball game. Mm -hmm. And um, so, mean, oh, go ahead. Uh, like at Four Winds Field, if they hear that one team member is going to be there, we've had other team members show up, um, yeah. bat girls show up, bat boys show up. Um, kids of former players just to have you know someone who remembers hanging out with their mom yeah um, so it's always a really great time and we always get just the best stories because they are just as peppy as they were in the 40s yeah so we get to hear all of the stories and it's usually different stories too oh, yeah. and we're like there are a lot of these um, and one of the things we have coming up in May um, Kristen mentioned Playland Park uh, by the student housing at IUSB and we've actually worked with the Indiana Historic Bureau and IU to get a historic marker placed there. So in May we're going to have the historic marker placed there and possibly a couple of players come out. Um, it's difficult to really know right now because I use still not sure how many people can go to a gathering um, in May, but that marker will be there. And so just keep your eyes out for information. Um, it'll be posted. Mm -hmm. We're hoping uh, just because there's going to be a limited amount of people who are going to be able to attend our little ceremony, um, we're hoping to live stream at all so you should be able yeah. to see it if not it's definitely getting recorded yeah. and it will be online for everyone to take a look at and now we save this till last just so <laughs> you know we didn't distract ourselves even more <laughs> um, we have some items we wanted to show you one of them I talked to you about the change in ball sizes and a lot of that had to do with softball uses a larger ball 12 inch diameter underhand pitch they moved to the side pitching, which then used an 11 inch ball and a nine inch, or a 10 inch ball. And then when they moved to overhand pitching, they switched to the traditional baseball size, which is um, nine and a fraction inches. So what we have here, I'm gonna have you hold. That is the softball that they started off with. And I don't have an 11 inch, but here's the 10 inch. That's when side pitching became popular. Are those balls autographed? Uh, yes. This one is. That one is not, yes. but we do have a 12 inch one that was. Downside with the autographs is that if they're exposed to light, they can fade. Um, they also can get rubbed off mm -hmm. eventually. So those are game balls. Those yeah. were played with. Yes. Yes, these, so. these balls these were, were played with. Uh, nowadays, if you see a nine inch ball that's autographed by teammates, those are usually from reunions. Um, and really, they will sign anything. If you see any of them and hand them something, they'll sign it for you. Yes, they're more than happy um, to. But so if you see a smaller one, it's probably not a game ball. I, I can. Here, I'll um, show you. Beginning to end, yeah. slightly yeah. different. So the 10 inch, 11 inch and 12 inch are always or almost always game balls that were autographed by the players. And two of these balls, if you want to keep a hold on that one, that one and this one, which the case is stuck, I couldn't get it out. Uh, these are both balls from the movie A League of Their Own. That ball is um, just a souvenir ball that is autographed by Tom Hanks, Gina Davis, Madonna, Lori, Lori Petty, Penny, Penny um, Marshall. And this one was actually used in the movie and is signed by Gina Davis, Tom Hanks, Madonna, and I believe Penny Marshall as well. Nope, not Penny Marshall. Just Gina Davis, Madonna, and Tom Hanks. 
I can't believe I said just those three. Yeah, they're um, nothing. So we also in our collection have um, uh, an original script autographed by them. That is pretty neat to bring out. Now I mentioned reunions. Another very popular thing for reunions are the souvenir bats. Um, and this one. I mean, they're exactly what they sound like they're tiny bats that the players will autograph. A lot of times the players also would receive these as, um, you know, gifts for attending the reunion and for their time um, given to the league. And then we are an actively collecting institution, which means even players donate to us. We just received a very large donation from Betsy. Um, I know it sounds like we absolutely love her. We do. She's a <laughs> sweetheart. Um, but she donated one of her ball caps that she played in. One of her uniforms is actually at the Smithsonian. I yeah. always like mentioning that because the Smithsonian is the Smithsonian. <laughs> and then this is from 1943. It, it is a little watch. It has Betsy's name inscribed on the back. This was uh, from when she was the league's leading hitter. So they gave her this for that year. Yeah, you can talk okay. about it. So this is, I don't know why she kept this. This is a packet of cigarettes that she picked up when she was in Cuba. Um, I'm going to say, unfortunately, Betsy was most likely a smoker back then. A lot of the girls were. Yeah, um, I mean, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. But this is just some of the small things that you would have kind of picked up as a souvenir over the years. And then we mentioned, if you want to pick that up, um, Dottie Collins, uh, her son, Rick Chapman, is the president of the Players Association. We have her catcher's uniform. So this is just one piece from the uniform that we have. Um, and then she is actually, if you ever see oh. the statue at Cooperstown of the woman swinging the bat, that's actually her. So it was based off of her. And then the final thing we brought, which I was supposed to pick up and show you earlier. Sorry, Kristen, <laughs> no, I fine. did not. This is a uniform from the Kalamazoo Lassies, actually played in. And let's go in the middle so that can... Everyone and Kristen's going to point out a couple of things um, about the uniforms over the years. Uh, so Mrs. Wrigley actually hired a number of like designers to come up with uh, the uniform. They wanted to put functionality and femininity into it. So you got this dress um, with some silk bloomers underneath it. Um, the girls were less than thrilled about having to wear this. Um, besides the fact that you're not wearing pants and you slide, you get those lovely strawberries on the side of your leg. Um, they were also at knee length originally, so when you're running and you have all this extra fabric flapping behind you, it kind of slows you down. And at the beginning, when they were still underhanding, uh, underhanded pitching, that you know your arm could catch your skirt. Uh, so the girls started to make alterations over the years. Um, for this pitching, when they were underhand, they actually cut the dresses in quite a bit. Um, if you see pictures of them online, they originally kind of looked like an A-line skirt, and at the end it was very form-fitting. Um, and they also got very short over the years. Um, like I said, the, they started off here, and there were many photos of girls who were basically just wearing mini dresses. Um, so they did a lot of things just to make things easier on themselves. I think they probably got in trouble, but after a while when everybody's doing it, I think they just went with, we're going to let the girls do what they want. Yeah. And when I was talking about the different name changes, you can always sort of date a uniform by this patch on the arm and what uh, what the letters are on the side. So this is a later one because it is AAGPBL or no AAGBBL. Yes, I always um, get that mixed up. But it's the All American Girls Baseball, Baseball League. League. So I always say P even when there's I no know. P. You get used to saying it after yeah. a while. So and that is what we have for you. If you uh, have any questions, please feel free to ask. We 
will hopefully have an answer yes. for you. <laughs> yes? What was the fabric of the uniform? It, it looks like it was canvas. It was actually a very heavy duty cotton. Um, think almost like a, like a denim weave. Um, but they were traditionally co cotton with the silk bloomers yep. underneath. Yep. Yes. A couple questions. So um, you said that uh, the championships, huh? the, the Blue Sox finished second by like that much mm -hmm. one year. So, so was there no tournament at the end to determine the champion or was it purely the winning percentage of the season? It depended from year to year and how many teams played. In the beginning, it was kind of whoever seemed to be doing best. Um, okay. And then they went to more of what we consider like a traditional like round robin championship okay. kind of thing. Um, and then they did have their all-star teams as well. So they had all-star tournaments where they picked the best players from each league to form teams. So then my second question was completely unrelated. And that's um, the, the player who had the child. Yes. Uh, uh, and you said that she played through like month four. And mm -hmm. Now, what, and she was a pitcher. Yes. Did, did pitchers hit and run? Or did they play American League rules when they were they had a designated hitter? Uh, I believe most of the time, if you pitched, you also hit. Um, Wow. In the later years. In the later years, definitely. Because um, running the pitching, I can running the bases mm -hmm. right there, it seems like really risky stuff. Yeah. Um, when she found out that she was pregnant, like I said, she talked to her doctor about it. She talked to the manager, um, and they did do a couple of things to kind of make sure that, especially as the trimesters went on, that she was safe. Um, I think probably her and her catcher just worrying over her sure. kind of yeah. mitigated her going, well, I think I'm done. Um, but I know that um, they, I mean, they just, they wanted to keep playing for as long as possible. Yes. I would think that switching to the smaller balls, they would have been harder to hit. Is there any correlation between batting averages with the larger balls as I, opposed to the smaller ones? I don't know about the specific batting average. What I can say is that um, the balls weren't the only thing that changed. So as the ball got smaller, the space between home plate and the pitching mound actually got longer. And um, the smaller balls, I believe they were a little easier to control. Um, but I don't think that they really had too much of a difference because they, they practiced with the balls that they had. And if I remember correctly, softball actually proved a little more difficult for them because of the uniform was it, really a huge part of it. Um, but also just, they were trained as baseball players. Uh, some of them were softball players, but they are actually two different sports. So I think they actually became better as the ball size was being smaller just because of the other changes that took place. I know that when they started moving over to side hand and then to overhand, a lot of the girls who didn't think that they could make it very well as a side or an overhand pitcher ended up switching to other positions. Um, and they ended up just recruiting girls who already knew how to throw side or overhand. I know one player wanted to keep pitching, and so she actually got um, a professional, like a major league uh, professional, to teach her how to play overhand. And I think that was probably the hardest thing for a number of the girls, but for like the barnstormer teams, a lot of them already played overhand, so it wasn't too much of a difference for them. And a lot of the ladies, when you talk to them, they started playing ball with their brothers and the boys in the neighborhood when they'd play sandlot ball. And so that's kind of how they got started, and their interest was baseball more mm -hmm. so than softball. Uh, Ma'am, you had a question? 
Has anyone, um, or is there a plan to reward the stories of the leftover players? Yes. Um, so over the years, the women have done a number of interviews, um, but like Grand Valley State University actually did a very large oral history program um, at a reunion and got a number of the women to participate in that. And we actually have a, a number of oral history videos of the ladies. So it is, it's a very big thing. Um, that a lot of areas are recognizing that's something that they had to do. And they yeah. do talk to the bat girls and the bat boys and um, any of the junior leagues. They had a large amount of junior leagues that started later on in the 40s and 50s. Um, kind of like, um, like the farm leagues for the major leagues. Um, so they got a lot of those as well. And there are a lot of players that uh, people have tried to get oral histories of, but um, <laughs> not to pick on Betsy again, they don't quite understand why it's so important. Like Betsy will say, why do you want to hear that? It, it was just a part of my life. Like it's my life, it's boring. And we're like, no, but we want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of them won't do oral histories. Some of them, they really, they don't know why we find it so interesting, so they don't know quite what to talk about. Um, but we're working on it, and we're yes. working on her. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they, don't, if they don't do the oral histories, did they keep diaries while they were playing? Or have any Some of them do. Um, like I said, we recently got a large donation from Betsy, and she has um, some, I don't know if they were full-fledged journals or just um, like some pages. She had, she um, Thankfully, as the archivist, she labeled all her photos, <laughs> uh, every place she was at, what year it was, where she was at, who she was with. It made my heart so happy. Um, but she did. She kept like every note she ever wrote to people. Um, we have lots of letters from the ladies when they would write home from places. So even if they didn't write journals, we do have markers of how they felt during a particular moment or things like that. And we have a lot of scrapbooks as well. Yes. Um, some of them are team scrapbooks, some of them are individual scrapbooks. And that's one of the things for the league that we get the most uh, research requests for, because you can find out so much that you didn't even know you were looking for mm -hmm. out of a scrapbook. Yes. How many items are there in your collection? Oh, wow. <laughs> what was the number? We, we provide a number every year to the league as we get donations. And we've received several very large donations mm -hmm. over the last um, four years, years or yeah. so. And I think this year's number was, it was over 6,000. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Um, I have a whole oh. shelving section that is just baseball related materials. And that's not including um, all the photos that we have. Um, we have over 2,000 photos, um, individual yeah. photos. That's not including scrapbooks or anything like that of just individual photos from, from players. So it's a sizable collection. Well, it's a little after 7 o'clock, I think, okay. and I want to be respectful of people's time. And if you want to stick around and ask some more questions, uh, I encourage you to do so. Let's give uh, Christine just a nice round of applause.